Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Anyways, uh, hey, uh, it's me, and we're back. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if your kids are listening to this show. That's a problem. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the line as he does each and every week on the show. It is Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend. Hey, buddy, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing okay. Just, uh, you know, hanging in here. How are you? I'm so happy right now. <laughs> really? Why are you happy? All right, we're going to start with the Alien Romulus trailer, the final one that just came out. Um Mike and I were sitting here the way we usually do. We're, you know, figuring out what we're going to talk about this week. And we got the list and all this. And uh, I just saw that, oh, there's a new Alien Romulus trailer. And you're really into this movie, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. So I'm watching the trailer. And I'm just going through it real quick. And it gets to the part where the face hugger is trying to stick its thing in the <laughs> guy's mouth. As, as, as <laughs> face huggers want to do, yeah. And I don't know what was so funny about it. But it was like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the face hugger is just sitting there. It's like, no teeth, damn it. I told you no teeth. <laughs> you know what? Just for that. <laughs> I don't know what was so funny. But it, 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 there's nothing funny about a face hugger trying to, you know, do that to you. But the, the, the way they showed it. <laughs> well, I still think the way they showed in that trailer is terrifying. And we're talking about the final trailer th that they've shown. But. To be honest, if you watch either of the other trailers, you'll see this same shot. They're being very secretive with this movie, especially with the appearance of the Xenomorph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I kind of respect that because I don't want to know everything about this. I only want to know just enough so I can go and have a real damn fun time at the movies. There's, there's enough in here where it's like, this is exciting. But yeah, I, I think it might also be because we were listening to a Family Guy clip earlier that sort of dug into Star Wars. And when you kind of think, look at it that way, where it's like you've got that mindset, you're just watching Alien. It's like, how would, how would a family guy handle this, I wonder? I, I don't know what it is about that, but all of a sudden, I went back to when I was doing the morning show with my buddy Moose. If he and I saw that clip together, oh, it's over. It, oh, God, would we have had a ton of fun with that for weeks. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about something today that I... Uh, I, that reminds me of that because uh, just uh, it, it, it has to do with like, seeing twisters this week. There are just certain things that you watch with friends and it's like, you, you, you know that you're going to be talking about this and talking about that yeah. and just having fun with it. Uh, Mike Reyes from cinema blend on the line with me right now. No alien Romulus looks terrifying. I'm sure. Uh, when's that? That's coming out. That's not too far away, right? August 16th. There you go. Uh, I'm sure we'll dive into that uh, once we're a little bit closer to it. In the meantime, uh, on the docket today, we're going to be talking about uh, there's a Beetlejuice trailer, there's Emmy nominations, uh, there's Deadpool news, there's Star Wars, uh, and then, of course, the movies that are coming out this weekend. Uh, let's start with the big one, Twisters. It's a sequel that, did we need it? It's kind of not a sequel. Oh, it isn't? It's not see the way that they're talking about it and the way the movie itself even present the movie presents itself is it exists in that universe but it's not continuing any particular story we don't get any mention of the characters it's real or the events it's really just we get some easter eggs like and you see it in the trailer and it's right in the beginning of the movie they have a dorothy five unit that sends out yeah. weather probes that's okay. like the closest you get to Twister and Twisters. Okay, I I legitimately thought this was, uh, you know, like a uh, a legacy. Like a, sequel. Yeah, 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 exactly. So well, that's that, uh, people have been very sort of corrective when it comes to using that term. And uh, another person who definitely is is a uh, Twister director, Jan de Bont, because we had him on uh, the in-house podcast, Real Blend. And he was talking about how I think he he wasn't he didn't know that the movie was happening until like pretty late in the day, and he's like, yeah, you really shouldn't call it a sequel. And I definitely see why because this is almost like think of Twister and Twisters as Friday the Thirteenth and Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Okay. The Twisters are sort of the monster or the killer, and you've got a new set of humans that are going in its way and trying to learn how to beat it. Right. But then drop that into an action 
comedy spectacular that feels like something the 90s would have given us in the best way possible. So you liked it? Oh, I had so much fun with Twisters. My big problem was that we did not get an IMAX or Dolby screening. We were shown this in a regular theater, and I was really sad about that because I had critic friends in other major cities on Monday that were going to see this, and I saw pictures of, like, IMAX and 4DX screenings. And I want to go back and see this in 4DX because I have not done a 4DX movie before, and this feels like the one to do it with. But as far as the movie's concerned, I had a lot of fun. This is charming. Uh, This is a big blockbuster spectacle, but director Lee Isaac Chung does not lose sight of the fact that there's people at the center of this. And you've got Daisy Edgar Jones and Glenn Powell as your functional leads, and they're charismatic as anything. But then just like Twister, you've got a backbench of wonderful supporting actors that you can recognize their faces and if you don't you will after this point and they all get their own little quirks and their own little lines and it's it's different enough that it, it does something different with the formula but at the same time you can tell that like this is someone who really did enjoy twister and knew how to nail the vibe and not just we're gonna tell the story and this is just going to be the next story. It's like, no, they, they nailed the vibe rather than the, the franchise. And yeah. I love it. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now. is uh, We talk about the movie Twisters. That's out this weekend. Not a legacy sequel. It's just in the same universe. Uh, what are the other movies that's coming out this weekend? Is Oddity? I don't know anything about this. Oddity is a, mo- a horror movie from IFC Films. Uh, I have not seen it yet, but I've seen the trailer, and I am very interested in seeing this. Synopsis here that I'm seeing here says, After the brutal murder of her twin sister, Darcy goes after those responsible by using haunted items as her tools for revenge. So right there, I'm thinking, what if Liam Neeson did Taken by way of Ouija. This seems like something that could go wrong really easy. Like, it could either be great or, wow, hmm, I don't know what to say about this. It's a concept where it's a a novel concept, but it's at that on that border where, like, you could get it wrong if you're not doing it the right way. Yeah, and like, like, it could go wrong real quick. Well, all you have to do is look at Ouija and Ouija Origin of Evil. Like, Ouija 1 came out, people hated it. But then you brought Mike Flanagan in to do Ouija Origin of Evil, and he totally turned people's perceptions around. And that was like, you basically had the same concept at the core. It was just done by two different visions. Okay. And so far, 98% on Rotten Tomatoes with 45 reviews. Uh, that's not, I don't know if that's enough to really get into freshness territory, but I would be very curious to see how this fares over the weekend. All right. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now as we make our way through it. Just because it go, does go into the reviews section, not a movie, obviously, but Star Wars E Acolyte wrapped up this week mike you you have not watched any of this right i watched the first episode and did not keep up with it because i was kind of caught wanted to be cautious as to what the commentary was and then when the commentary started coming in it's like um just i'm good although i may have another movie review for you okay okay this wrapped up this week and i was talking to a few friends at work um and it's very interesting where people kind of go with this where some people really like it, uh, some people liked it, but they know that it had clunky storytelling. And then there's me who I wish that they could have taken the best parts out of this series and just either given me a couple special, like a uh, part one and a part two special, or making a movie. Yeah. It should not have been eight episodes long. I think that's something that Disney's starting to reevaluate, has been reevaluating in the past couple of years, because don't forget Obi-Wan Kenobi was supposed to be a set of movies before it became a limited series. Armor Wars was going to be a limited series and now has been turned into a movie. And I wouldn't be surprised if more whisperings of this sort of shift come out after the huge alleged Disney data breach. (sighs) There's so much in here that it's like, okay, the idea of setting up a world where the Jedi are sort of corrupt, that's cool. I like it to try and do the other stuff you did it and to waste. They had, did you see uh, anything from this last episode? Nope. So apparently Darth Plagueis shows up. I, I heard that. I heard that. Which is funny because I was talking to my buddy and I was talking to my wife. Like she, uh, she goes, who's that? And listen, I've seen the star Wars stuff. I'm like, I don't know. He like creeps around a corner and that's all you see. It's like, 
three or four seconds. That is as much as he's in there. And they never once address it. And for my wife, who is not a Star Wars fan, she was uh, automatically, who was that? Like, I don't know. I had to look it up and see later. It's like, oh, that was Plagueis? Dude, you should have turned over, looked at her and said, do you not know the tale of Darth Plagueis the Wise? She wouldn't have got it. She would have just looked at me like I'm an idiot the way she mostly does. But would you not have been happier to have done that, to have had a legitimate moment to drop that in conversation? Oh, it'd be awesome. It would be totally awesome. I'm not saying it wouldn't. It's just my wife is not the person I would use it on because she wouldn't appreciate it. So, so they had that. They had a the bleeding of a Kuiper crystal, which it I was. I thought I heard something along those lines too. Which was really cool to see, but I'm sad it was wasted in this show. I'm sad that the first time we see something like this was in the Acolyte. Yeah. And then there was some stuff that just kind of, and, and don't get me wrong, the scene itself was pretty awesome. I felt bad for the Kuiper crystal to see oh, how. Oh, it's like the shoe in Roger Rabbit. Kind of, it was, and it kind of like she ignited the lightsaber, and then it started to turn red, and then it kind of fought against it, and it was kind of going back and forth, and then it goes all red, and it's like, oh, that poor Kuiper crystal. But uh, you know, then you had some scenes that just don't make sense. Like we find out the guy that's wearing the helmet is the former apprentice of uh, the green skinned lady. Uh, that's kind of the corrupt yeah. person. And he's got this big, like, whip scar on his back, which we find out later. Oh, it's uh, it. he was a, the apprentice of the lady with the whip lightsaber, which they completely showed this whip lightsaber, you know, tearing through a, a, a an animal in half. And it's like, how did he survive oh. that with nothing but a scar? Wow, you're really selling me on this, man. But, I mean, it was stuff like that. It's like, eh, really? Okay. It just, I, I, the couple episodes where they set up the bad guy and they set up, uh, you know, this kind of, you know, like the Jedi are sort of corrupt and all this. It, it was like the idea is there. I just don't think they executed it very well. And again, mm. it's a bunch of characters that I don't care about. And you I want, Jedi kids are so whiny. The Shut other, up and eat your, eat your training. I miss being a Star Wars fan, but <laughs> there's, I'm, I'm, I miss being a total Star Wars fan and not just certain pockets that I enjoy over others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move it right along. Let's get back on the road here. Uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me. Uh, where do you want to go? Do you want to do Deadpool? Oh, what was the other movie you said? Uh, I saw Long Legs. Oh, uh, apparently everybody, like, there is a scene in it that is just messing everybody up. I wonder which scene it is. I don't know because but on TikTok, I was trying to find it. How? how is it? Oh, it's so good. Basically, it, Long Legs is, it is a horror movie. Okay. But the thing is, it's like a horror, it's a horror movie in the sense that Sounds of the Lambs and Seven have always been classified as horror movies. So it's that type of horror movie, but there is a mix of the supernatural in there. Okay. It doesn't completely dominate the the total movie, but it's in there. Okay. And it's, it's fantastic. Osgood Perkins is a master of these sort of insular personal stories that scratch at a greater world and the unknown darkness. And he's, it, oh man, he's outdone himself and so has the cast. I mean, Michael Monroe is a great protagonist for us to be following around. Alicia Witt, who a lot of people would know from various projects like uh, being the little girl from the original 1984 Dune, is pretty chilling and like stoic. And then... Of course, Blair Underwood is fantastic. It's like the head of the FBI because it's, it's, it's a movie about FBI agents tracking down a serial killer. And there's a lot of questions of like, how is he able to do what he does as the sort of pattern and the wide web of what he's doing unfolds? Okay. Which leads to Nicolas Cage once again being fantastic. Academy Award winner gives you exactly what you want, Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Nicholas. His portrayal of the titular serial killer is delightful, fantastic, very chilling. When you get into Hollywood and you see certain people, you think, okay, you should be able to do this part, no problem. Nicholas Cage and serial killer kind of go together. I would say that Nicholas Cage is almost a skeleton key. Like he's he's that wonderful crossroads between a leading actor, but also he is able to do pretty much anything that he sets his mind to. Like mm. he is just a, a wonderful consummate performer that has stretched himself into all these different roles and he never phones it in, always throws himself in 150%. 
and I just, I admire him. That would be an interesting uh, article, the best skeleton key actors, the ones that fit into just about any role possible. I wonder if they would, just thinking of like an editor's headlining perspective, I wonder if they would just switch it to like most versatile character actors. Yeah, they do. But like, I want to coin that term. I want to coin that term, skeleton key actor. Just like uh, on overdue rentals, there's a term that I like to repeat called the five minute crusher. And it's basically an actor where like, they're so good that you could cast them in one scene for five minutes or less and they'll totally knock it out of the park. And the reason I came up with that was because of uh, the example that always comes up is an outbreak when JT Walsh was brought in uncredited and has like a five minute scene in the white house basically explaining this is the shit we're going through with this virus and <laughs> you need to really think hard before we go through this plan and just uh, see also ned Beatty and, and network fit, knocking it out of the park with one scene yeah just oh, wow, when network. you are a oh i love network it, it's it's leaving hbo Max. it's leaving max again and i'm sad i just need to buy a copy already yeah you probably should mike Reyes from cinema blend on the line all right, so that's Long Legs. Uh, go see it. Uh, it looks spectacular. I, it's, I just want to see Nicolas Cage in this. So, Yeah. Uh, Joe, uh, it, 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 no, go ahead. The marketing, has been amazing for, the marketing has been amazing for this movie to the point where right before it came out, apparently said when Micah Monroe first saw Nicolas Cage's appearance in the film, when she first saw him on set, I guess, her heart rate went up to 170 beats per minute. Oh, wow. That's... Which apparently is very dangerous, like death or heart attack territory. So I'm wondering, my wife brought that up to me, and she's like, that's like heart attack death territory. And she questioned the claim, and I was like, yeah, they, they might be like goosing it up a little bit for the, the marketing. I don't care if they're goosing it up for the marketing. That's the type of marketing you go into this sort of horror movie with. And the fact that they've had all these trailers since January that have been slow burning this movie that have not revealed Nicolas Cage's appearance at all, or like very briefly, I, you have to commend that, especially yeah. when you've got ad campaigns that show you everything, especially when you go back and watch it after the movie. And you notice, wait a minute, they totally showed me the ending here. What the hell? Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line. All right, so over in the world of movie news and whatnot, Deadpool 2 or Deadpool, Deadpool Wolverine, there it is. Deadpool 3, Deadpool and Wolverine, the, Deadpool 3, MCU Boogaloo. The advertising for this How movie has just been... the title? I don't know. I, it, it, I don't know. Uh, but uh, we got another trailer the other day. We got, uh, we got a new video game controller. Where it, is it Xbox or PS5? I can't remember. That looks like an Xbox controller with Deadpool's ass in the back. Yeah, it's, it's legitimately just butt cheeks. Uh, I saw, the, did you see the Jack in the Box trailer or a uh, commercial with Deadpool? No, I didn't. But were you the person I was talking with where we were comparing Wolverine and Deadpool suits? Um, I said that... Oh, I Wolverine suit did Deadpool not flatter his ass. That exactly. You were the person I was talking to about that. Yeah. No, that's, look, they, someone, I think someone heard us. Ryan Reynolds, if you're listening to this show, come on the show. Talk to us. Uh, it's an we Xbox would love controller. To have you congratulate us for helping. <laughs> what? It's an Xbox controller. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, anyways, why? What did he do? Did they say something about it? Ass. What happened? Well, did they say something about it? What happened to his ass? No one said anything about anyone's ass. No, it's just the asses on the controller. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I see where you're going with that. Um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm just... saying, like, I don't think a PlayStation 5 controller would support that ass. Uh, this movie comes out next week, right? Uh, yep. Well, are you going to be able to see it? Unfortunately not, because I am going to be traveling out of the country starting Monday night. And that's the night of the screening. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> Which is really interesting, because the whole thing, well... I might I might take a look and see if I'm able to get to a screening the night I come back because I come back on Thursday. Okay. And it's like Thursday afternoon, so maybe if jet lag's not whipping me around, it's like, yeah, I'll go see a screening tonight because okay. I'm going to see it again on Saturday for 3D anyway. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So we might have to do like a last-minute Friday morning, hey, guys. Oh, God, everything sucks, and I don't know where I am. No, we'll have to figure it out. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice got a new trailer. And a couple things uh, I thought of uh, when I saw this. One, it looks a little bit more like the cartoon where it's Beetlejuice and Lydia having adventures together. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think of that. You're right. 
And two, I wonder how many jokes about Bob, uh, hey, you handle things here. I can't remember exactly how he said it. Uh, hold down the fort. Oh, yeah, hey, Bob, hold down the fort. Yeah, I wonder how many jokes we're getting, because they had at least two in there, maybe three uh, during that. But uh, no, the thing that I was going to bring up earlier that uh, I thought was funny, uh, right when Beetlejuice comes in, they hit this really cool you know, beat, and it goes into a song, right? Do you know what yeah. that is? What? It's the Bee Gees. It's tragedy. Oh, yeah, tragedy. I just really liked the remix of it. I was like, oh, my God, that's really cool. And, and I'm like, the Bee Gees, what? I thought it. I thought my Shazam messed up on my phone. Oh, no, I, I picked up on that when I watched it. It's like, ooh, yeah, like, I, I agree. The remix is very good. Like, uh, I'm hope it's another one of those cases where I'm hoping it's in the movie. Like, I, I, it's a slight pet peeve when you have a really good trailer cut to a certain song. And then it's not in the movie. Uh, the also Hitman's b- wife's bodyguard, where they had that really good edit to Britney Spears' Baby One More Time, and then it's <laughs> the, it's Ace of Bases' The Sign that's in the movie. Yeah. And it's like, boo, don't bait and switch me here. Ryan, Ryan Reynolds, come on the show and explain yourself. Just please come talk to us. Ooh, Ryan Reynolds in a Beetlejuice movie. Oh, now that would be interesting. Because you probably have to have him as either a paranormal expert or maybe another entity that's sort of like has a, has something against Beetlejuice. He's Ortho's son. Ortho, that would be interesting. Or or what was it? Was it Ortho? Ortho. Ortho. I was thinking Orco from. Uh, well, that's what, well, that's who I thought Justin Thoreau's character was in the trailer at first, and I, I think the jury's still out on that. But it also looks like he might be dating Lydia, or, or maybe like I I don't know what's going on there. I like, th- there's that little bit in the trailer where they get sunk in a couple's counseling with Beetlejuice. Are you ready to spill your guts? Okay, I am. <laughs> can I just, can, can we just once again highlight Michael Douglas, I mean, sorry, Michael Keaton Douglas. Michael Keaton. I think his full name is Michael Keaton Douglas. I will look it up as you make Instagram your point. Handle. But Michael Keaton is a legend. Yeah, and seeing it, he has always been talked about how he wanted to come back to Beetlejuice. He wanted to do this sequel. Watching him in these trailers, you see it. You absolutely see him happy to come back to Beetlejuice. Michael John Douglas is his real name. Michael John Douglas. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was confusing. His, I was confusing it with his Instagram handle, Michael Keaton Douglas. <laughs> he. It, it just looks like fun. I. I'm excited about this movie. I think it's one of those things where you could take a world like Beetlejuice. You did the 80s movie with it. You did, you know, what you could with special effects at the time. And now you can uh, kind of open it up and widen it, you know? Yeah, like I, I'm i kind of hoping that if this is successful enough and they want to continue making them, because obviously when you do a legacy sequel like this, it's like, okay, we're going to come back and remind people the rules of the world. We're going to do a very simple story where it's like, we remind you what it was like to love this again, like they did yeah. The Force Awakens. Then the next one's like, okay, let's dive deeper into this world, change some of the, you know, go into, break some of the rules, change some of the rules, introduce new people into the mix and just go wild. Nice f***ing model. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, and then the trailer basically, uh, I, I think the trailer basically gives us where the, the F bomb's going to be this time. Yeah. Cause he just looks at something at the altar and, he, I, and he's like, what the f***? Of course it's bleeped. Yeah. Just like we're bleeped. But then on top of that, I, is, is he trying to marry Lydia's daughter, or is he trying to marry Lydia again? Because it looks like there's a whole altar scene there, and is he trying to come back to our world again through marriage? And like, maybe there's also the fact that it looks like Monica Bellucci is playing his wife, who I think is looking for him, and I think is looking for him through Willem Dafoe, Undead Private Eye. Yeah, I didn't know William Dafoe was going to be in this. Oh, Willem Dafoe's in here. And I need to, he has an awesome, I'm looking up his character name right now because he had something really awesome. Wolf Jackson. (laughs) Wolf Jackson, a ghost detective who in life was a B-movie action star, according to Wikipedia. Oh, wow. Sold. Totally sold. If Just, Willem Dafoe's another one of those people that if he's digging it, you see it on his face. You see it in the, in the in the performance. And I feel like he, from what we're seeing so far, that is exactly what's going on here. There is not one person in this trailer I can think of that's just like, eh, I'm doing a Beetlejuice movie. It's like everybody understands what this opportunity is. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now as we talk about uh, Beetlejuice. That's coming out, I believe, September 6th. Should be awesome. 
I uh, can't wait for it. As we wrap up this week, uh, Emmy nominations came out. And anything stand out to you, Mike? Uh, besides the fact that I do, uh, I do agree with people saying that why is the bear consistently in the comedy? Why is it constantly in the comedy category? Yeah, it's besides lame. the fact that it's an obvious, like it's an easy win or easier win than like going up against some of the other uh, other dramas. The drama category this year is stacked. Like I, I, half of these shows are things that I watch and like, and I it's, it feels kind of weird. Yeah, it's not all. It's not every year that you get a bunch of shows that you. I know that show. Fallout is being has been nominated for quite a few things, including best drama series, and I think Walton Goggins was nominated for. Uh, I want to say, or let's see here. Uh, I want to say outstanding actor in a a drama. Uh, I yes, look this up. best I have actor. To, I have it in front of me. Just Walter Goggins. Um, let's see. Yeah, the bear. Like I would put Fallout in the comedy uh, area before I would the the bear. There's nothing about the bear that is ever. I just the bear is tense to me. Like we haven't watched season three yet because I don't, neither have I. I I don't want to. Like I like the show, but I don't want to watch it. I don't want to be stressed out. Oh no, I I totally get you. But at the same time, like I I I am excited to see Bear season three because everyone keeps talking about it, and like this is one of the better sides of court appointed viewing. Also, oh, kind of surprising. I need to watch this show. Idris Elba has been nominated for outstanding leading actor in uh, Hijack, which is an Apple TV Plus show that looks like a kind of new spin on Twenty Four. Okay. I'm all right where it's with like that. he was on a, a, I think it was sort of real time or close to real time where he was on a plane that was hijacked and he was like trying to defuse the situation. He's like, I think he's a government agent or he's just a skilled badass. But yeah, that was nice to see. Uh, it's nice to see the Gilded Age also getting a lot of love through nominations. Although I'm surprised that the acting nominations are dominated by the morning show in both actor and actor. Or supporting actor and supporting actress. That's a show where it's like, I know it's popular, but it still surprises me that it's popular. <laughs> because it's like, okay, I, I know I've, I've heard of this from other industry friends and some chatter online, but it's like it doesn't feel as on the present as a show like on broadcast would when it does that. That's no knock to streaming. Although it was also nice to see Shogun get a lot of nice nominations. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that that's happening and We'll see what happens with the next season. Should the Daily Show have a caveat that it's only with John Stewart? No, no, because what happens is well, which which, uh, which nomination are you looking at? I just was scanning through and I saw Variety Talk Series, The Daily Show, Comedy Central. Oh yeah, Outstanding Talk Series. That's like that. That's not a stipulation because I think even under Trevor Noah, it was still being nominated because it's not just a. That's a. That's an outfit where it's not just the host. It very much is the writing staff and the correspondents. Okay. And I don't think, I don't think it's just, uh, John's, although I wouldn't be surprised if John Stewart's return did kind of give it a little more goose. Boy, he's Although good that. that that's all he, I, I missed him so much. And while it is exciting to see the rotating, the rotating uh, lineup of hosts that they've had recently, I love, I have loved seeing him sort of get back into classic John Stewart mode and just hammering away at some of this stuff. Acting entertainment wise, that, that is what he was meant to do in my mind. First of all, the daily show itself was so seminal and hammering in the culture of learning about news through humor, because before that you did have shows like not necessarily the news or which was based off of a uh, British original, not necessarily the nine o'clock news. You had satire programs all over, but the, what the daily show really seemed to hammer in was the formula of reporting the news, but then having snarky commentary that really dug into it. And then also his interviewing is still phenomenal. I still haven't watched, uh, I haven't finished it, but I started watching the other day. He brought Bill O'Reilly back on. And the first question he asks him was, very relevant to not only O'Reilly's experience as an author, but things that have been going on in current events. And I'm tap dancing around it because if people really want to know, they can go take a look at it. <laughs> but it, he, he, it's just, it's, it's the type of interviewing that I aspire to do. It's like, if there's any sort of interviews that I, two of the interviewers that I hold near and dear to my heart are John Stewart from daily show. And then Sean Evans from hot ones. Okay. 
and it's because they seem to go they seem to approach their subjects with knowledge but also a conversational approach that's not just I'm here to get the news and only the news just the facts it's like that's if you're going to if you're going to do an interview like that you're doing straight news yeah. and if you're doing that in entertainment or on a show like the daily show you're you're missing the point really amazing about this is this started with the Emmy talk and it went into Jon Stewart on the daily show so uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now as we wrap up this week. Any final thoughts this week, Mike? No, I think I think that's pretty All good. Thank I think you. I've, I think I've made my point. <laughs> oh. As he stepped on my dick. That's right. As he stepped on my dick, everybody, here on Public Radio Access or something. I'm stepping on dick. The new one from Beethoven. We'll be right back. <laughs> stepping on your dick. The new single from Taylor Swift. Oh, boy, there you go. All right, we'll leave it there. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend joins me every week to talk about movies. Uh, have a good rest of the weekend, Mike. You too, man. Go see a movie or something. No. An addendum to this week's uh, podcast entry. Uh, Mike and I were having a very <laughs> lovely conversation there about something completely uh, off the topic of movies and whatnot. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden it popped up. Sadly, Bob Newhart, has passed at the age of 94, according to multiple sources. Yep. Uh, looks like it came from his publicist, Jerry Digny. Uh, Bob Newhart was apparently, uh, it says to hear that he had passed after a series of short illnesses at his Los Angeles home. 94 is just, that's an amazing run for a, a, a any person, but especially someone like Bob Newhart, who's had such a legendary career as a comedian, both in stand-up throughout the, the 60s and then not only one but two six, long successful sitcoms, Bob Newhart, The Bob Newhart Show and Newhart. And then you even go into his later career and he appeared in Elf and he was on The Big Bang Theory. Like this, Bob Newhart is someone that is timeless and was able to, to stretch generations effortlessly, kind of like a, a, like we were talking about Donald Sutherland when he passed. Yeah. Like in that very same vein. He was such a, I'm trying to think of the right word to say with it, but the, the way he approached characters and the kind of the real dead world thing. comedy, he, yeah, dead, dead. Yeah. That's a, the, uh, that is the term, but just the way he approached the characters with that, with that tone and the way he looked at people, it was so well done. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. And I, I feel like deadpan is something that a lot of people, you either get it or you don't, but it's such a, it, it is just such a, a, an underrated skill. And he was one of the, the greatest practitioners of it. And, you know, you even just go back and watch him in, in Elf. And just the way that he narrates, like, Buddy's story. And every now and then it cuts to him with, like, looking over the glasses. And he's kind of got that, like, I can't believe I'm explaining this to you look. But Yeah, yeah, me. yeah. When he wanted it to be condescending, it was. But for the most part, it was just, okay, this isn't on you. This is on me. I should, be, I should explain to you what's going on here. And when someone earned his scorn, it was there. What I remember most, like, I remember Elf. I remember, you know, just, you know, all these things. But... How brilliant was the end of New Heart? Um, so brilliant that even people that have not watched the show know how brilliant it is. They ended the show with another TV series as a dream. And as if that wasn't already clever enough, the whole MTM family of TV shows were technically connected by saying elsewhere. Oh my goodness. I... New but there's a whole overarching theory about how St. Elsewhere connects to almost uh, so many other TV shows because of the stuff that it did. Oh, wow. That's crazy. New Heart, the show, was kind of my first real, like, that's how Bob New Heart was introduced to me. I remember that show as a kid, as a small kid. Like, I didn't get all the jokes and I didn't uh, kind of understand everything that was happening. But that was my first taste of Bob New Heart. My no, brother exactly. Daryl, my other like brother Daryl. <laughs> Newhart was like Frasier in the sense that it just was, it, it was, if you were the right of the right age and the right sense of humor, that was sort of your entry into adult, the, the world of adults and like art and like very arch humor. Oh man, that's sad.
It is, but at the same time, it's like 94 is a hell of a run for anybody. Yeah. And for him to have that is just, it's, the man was a legend for so many reasons. And he could reach across to anybody for fun, like in the name of fun and comedy. But it was, again, not punching down at people, not trying to look at everybody and just snark them into oblivion. Yeah. It was just a lot of, this is how I see the world, and it doesn't make sense to me. And does it make sense to you? Because here's what I'm thinking, and explain to me if I'm wrong. Like, that was very much his, and he was so good at being, like, self-deprecating and just being in on the joke. There are people that you laugh at, and then there are people that you laugh with. And I don't think for a second that the world laughed at Bob Newhart. I think we always laughed with him. Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com joins me every week to talk about movies. Uh, to Bob Newhart, we wish you nothing but the best in the great beyond. Mike, have yourself a great weekend. You as well, sir.